Hello and welcome back to People's Dispatch. Uh, today we're joined by longtime activist Asav Rahman, who is also the currently the executive director of War on Want, an organization that fights for an end to poverty and injustice. Um, Asad, like thousands of other people across the UK, has been on the streets um, in this amid this moment of kind of complete political chaos and crisis. Uh, in the country, but specifically against the very regressive bills that the conservatives in parliament are trying to pass. So he's with us today to explain what's happening in this moment and give us a little background on these bills and what they mean uh, for rights for people in the country. You know, party gate is happening. There's, you know, this questioning happening in parliament, um, lots of controversy with the Tories. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's also this parallel process of trying to pass these regressive bills. Can you kind of reflect a little bit on the political situation right now in the UK? You know, what is this bourgeois debacle? How does this have an impact on the lives of people? Is this related to the bills? Give us a little background on the situation right now. So we have, of course, and are still in the midst of the corona pandemic. We have one of the highest death tolls uh, relative in the world. Over 170,000 people have lost their lives over the last couple of years. We've got a huge cost of living crisis, crisis of poverty and inequality. We have over four and a half million people relying on food banks in this country, many people who are in work poverty, so they are working but not making enough to either heat their homes or feed their families. We have seen inflation increasing, energy prices doubling. Uh, we The economic uh, situation for working people and particularly uh, 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 the most vulnerable in our society is looking very, very bleak. And yet in the midst of this, we have the prime minister potentially uh, at risk of having to resign. And this is because of a series of rules that the government brought in in the at the height of the pandemic uh which were you know uh, restricting the rights of people to uh, uh meet with other people outside of their households it was very very strict even in fact on, on during may of, of of 2020 the government was reiterating this message that during the summer months people shouldn't be socializing outside and yet uh, bit by bit, despite the government insisting that there had been uh, no breaches of these rules by the government itself or from Downing Street, the, the, the residence and the political office of the Prime Minister, we have seen leak after leak basically saying there were parties taking place, uh, parties in the garden, parties in the basement of Downing Street, alcohol being served, um, um, you know, snacks, etc. And a lot of people are rightly angry that they couldn't be with their loved ones when people were losing their lives. They couldn't see their families who were in care homes. They couldn't be, even attend funerals when people uh, lost loved ones in their family because of the quite rigorous and strict rules that were in place and yet the government seemed to be breaching them so this idea of one rule for ordinary people and rules that the rich and powerful can just simply break has angered so many people and we're in the midst now of a, an inquiry and in the next week or so we will see the results of that inquiry and whether the prime minister has been lying to parliament and to the british public and therefore whether he will survive uh, so there's a lots of machinations going on inside the conservative party um, and within Parliament as well, whether this will be one lie too many for the Prime Minister. And we have to remember, our Prime Minister has a long history of uh, uh, making incendiary remarks, whether those were racist remarks, calling black people, picking in his with watermelon smiles, uh, uh, being caught out lying in his previous roles, but like much of the rich, always falling upwards uh, from one job to a bigger job and that never being a criteria and in the midst of all of this of course uh, the government seems to be uh, going for, uh, all out for an assault on fundamental rights of people in this country to uh, be able to organize to be able to mobilize to be able to protest yeah i mean it's a it's hard to believe that that's that's the panorama we're in right now um and so i was hoping you know 
you could give us a little bit more information on some of the most contentious bills that uh, Parliament is uh, proposing right now. Um, we know the policing bill has been, you know, has brought people onto the streets. Uh, the House of Lords struck down certain parts of it. Can you explain a little bit about this bill and explain why is it so, what, why does it threaten so much people's rights in the UK and what would it mean um, for progressive movements, for people's movements going forward if it were passed? Yeah. So, I mean, actually, there's a series of bills that have been going through Parliament at this time. So there is this very controversial police and crimes bill. It's actually full title is the police crime sentencing and courts bill. It's a huge package of measures, very, very draconian. And I'll speak about that in the moment. We have a nationality and borders bill going through Parliament. We've just we have attempts by the government to limit judicial reviews. So this is the right of people to take the government to court uh, when uh, people feel that their rights have been uh, ignored or overturned through by legislation. We have just uh, voted through, Parliament has just voted through a new voter ID uh, bill, which will make it incumbent on people to show voter IDs before they can vote. Uh, we have very, very little instance of voter fraud in the UK, but we have about four and a half million people who don't have uh, a, a photo ID with them. Overwhelmingly, of course, working class people, black and uh, uh, and in the black community. And this is seen as a whole scale attempt at basically uh, gerrymandering uh, who can and who won't be able to vote. Um, we also have a threat to roll back the Human Rights Act, which is uh, uh, our uh, piece of legislation which governs and guarantees our rights here in the UK, and also the government threatening to make illegal the right to boycott. Um, and uh, of course, this is for two reasons. One, to try and attack the right and it's part of the continuing onslaught on on those who advocate on for the rights of the palestinian people they want to make the call for bds uh illegal uh to take away the right of local authorities and institutions to adopt uh, boycott divestment or sanctions proposals and of course it won't be just affecting uh issues around palestine it will also be hugely impactful on you know movements working around climate and climate justice and, and trying to take action against the fossil fuel industry but just talking about the police crime and sentencing and courts bill uh it's a fundamentally a huge bill which really their goal is to restrict our right as citizens to be able to hold the government to count and fundamentally our right to protest and what's happened is there's been uh, the bill itself the existing bill that was uh, put forward by the government uh, gave the police incredible new powers like uh, basically about when how where and even how many people are allowed to protest i mean it's and and breaching that uh, uh causing so-called serious annoyance uh, uh has huge custodial sentences up to 10 years uh there is a fundamental attack on the right of gypsy and traveler communities in their way of living it's making it a basically a criminal offense for you to reside in a vehicle uh and uh, if you cause distress and these terms are so vague so basically it allows the right just to say well that traveler site is causing me distress and of course we know that disproportionate uh and, and and racist policing disproportionately affects both gypsy roma traveler and of course the black communities massive new expansion of suspicionless stop and search powers uh, these were powers that the the police used to have and enact on a daily basis there when i was growing up and part of the black movement uh they were our fight they were what sparked the uprisings in 1981 and 84, which was just literally the police stopping and searching every young black person and every person of, of, of colour. Um, we are seeing legislation and clauses that will basically allow the police to take our personal data from agencies. So your political affiliations, your religious belief, your health, they will be able to do that. They'll be able to make individual profiles of you. And we know we can already see from what the government has done on terms of the gang matrix. It has this so-called predictive uh, using of, of data to have predictive policing. And overwhelmingly, something like 72% of the people on this matrix are black. And yet 
only 27% of those people involved in gangs and involved in violence are black. So we can already see that uh, it, this will be disproportionately affecting the, the black community uh, and, and will be a massive increase in powers. But, and what, what it's also doing is, is really challenging our right because what it's going to bring in is this idea of, 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 of nuisance and disturbance and basically limit our right to even make noise uh, I mean, it's just incredible. The police will be able to determine if we cause serious uh, de uh, uh, nuisance to either a organization, I put that in basically means a company, or an individual, I, an individual even walking down the street may say that that protest is causing me a nuisance. The police will then have powers to be able to shut it down. And even if we as a protester don't know that the police have imposed those conditions on us, uh, we will still be liable. In addition, I mean, literally, it seemed like the Home Secretary had been sitting watching her television screen, looking at protests, and this is, of course, on the back of the Black Lives Matter and the climate protests that have taken place, and, uh, and, and much of this legislation is about preventing those protests from ever taking place. They want to make, if you target statues, a, a, an imprisonable offence of up to 10 years, because, of course, they want to do very, very little about the fact that, uh, uh, about what these statues represent, but are tackling the so-called heritage of British of Britain, the history of Britain through statues of slave owners like Edward Colson is going to be made a criminal offence. And this is, again, because the juries are finding people not guilty uh, when, it, when it comes to court. They wanted to put in new legislation which would make even the, 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 the idea of lock-on, you know, i.e. two people joining, uh, it, it might be even joining their hands. It's so vague, let alone the more sort of uh, tactic of, 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 of lock-ons that have been used in terms of climate movement, uh, that to be uh, imp imprisonable. I mean, it's it's literally lock, stock and barrel. There will be a blanket ban around par protests around Parliament, so no longer will we be able to protest at the home of so-called democracy. So uh, the it is probably the most draconian attack on our right to protest. It will affect everybody from workers and trade unions having the right to pick it, to climate, to anti-racist, and of course the history, as we know, of all of our countries, and particularly here in the UK, is no rights have ever been given to us. We've snatched them from the powerful through protests, through organising. This would make it illegal for the anti-racist movement, for the lesbian and gay movement, climate movement would make it illegal for the suffragettes, for trade unionists. I mean, literally every single movement that's ever changed change anything within our history would be liable to uh, uh, uh would fall foul of these pieces of legislation so it's a very very draconian piece of legislation and it sits alongside this other piece of legislation which is called the nationality and borders bill which is part of the ongoing war on so-called migrants and refugees and uh, we again see this happening all across Europe, this narrative of walls and fences of Western countries wanting to basically roll back from their legal and international obligations under the Refugee, Refugee Act. They want to talk about pushing back boats in the, in the channel. They wanted to make it a criminal offence, and this may have made it a criminal offence if you assist people in, uh, in 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 coming to the UK, so this is not just about so-called people smugglers. It might be a refugee who's steering the boat from uh, from from France to the UK would be liable to that. To that, they wanted to make it uh, make it that those people, uh, border officers who may commit a crime, including that leads to the loss of life of somebody, would have impunity if they were doing that to protect our borders. So this is a whole narrative. But alongside it, the UK government also wants to put in a new clause which would strip, allow the government to strip our citizenship without even telling us. And um, we, saw, we saw this beginning in the war on terror uh, where we've seen the UK government basically saying those people with either dual nationalities or where their parents or grandparents were from another country, even if you were born in this country, you have no relationship, then that would, that you're, 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 the UK is able to strip your citizenship. And as we know, that's a fundamental power that if you allow the state to have that power to strip away your citizenship and push you into another country, I mean, it's literally draconian. And as we know with all of these things, 
that once they're imposed, they never repeal. They just become more and more pernicious. The state grants more and more power. And as we know, uh, uh, it, we, we're literally, we're crossing the Rubicon in terms of even the pretense about liberal democracy and liberal rights. Uh, and I think many of us recognise that this is going to get much, much worse as these multiple crises happen around the world, as our own economic system is unable, as the, uh, the bankrupt system that we have is unable to re re uh, uh, realise the, right, the, the, the needs of people, and we will see more and more protests, they already want to be able to clamp down on that. I mean, it's it's hard to believe that that's <laughs> that set of you know just the specific targeting of every single kind of protest action. Um, I mean, unsurprisingly, there's been a lot of outrage from you know progressive sections across the board. As you mentioned, this affects not only you know climate movement, trade union. Everyone's been it seems on the streets to reject this bill, rightfully so. Can you just? Uh, you know, finalize by telling us, you know, what are people's movements doing in the UK in response to these bills? Um, and what is the way forward to fight these measures? Um, and what do you see as kind of the struggle for the next couple of months? So there has been a, a very, very powerful campaign uh, against the police uh, bill and increasingly trying to tie the police bill also with the borders and nationality, but with the with the borders bill as well. Um, and just this last weekend, uh, we had huge protests taking place up and down the country. The House of Lords was voting on some of these amendments and uh, and threw a lot of pressure uh, uh, over. I think you know recent opinion polls show that over two thirds of people in the UK uh, are concerned about these attack on rights. Uh, over eight hundred thousand people signed a petition that was delivered, and that lobbying meant that in the House of Lords, the some of these amendments new amendments that the UK government had, in, had, had introduced were repealed. Now, the problem is, of course, that the government has a very significant majority in the House of Commons. So it will now come back to the House of Commons. There will be a bit of a ping pong between our two houses, the unelected House of Lords, which is great irony that the unelected House of Lords is, is becoming our bastion to defend our rights, and the elected House of Commons. And then it will come to vote and whether uh, there will be sufficient votes to take down some of the more egregious elements of the of the bill is yet to be seen. I mean, a lot of, of course, the government's mind and energy is about protecting and uh, uh, the prime minister. There is uh, the, there is a, 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 a they've called it Operation Save Big Dog. Uh, which means basically the operation to save the prime minister. So that means that the government may not have put a, as the same amount of energy and, and and behind this bill. So we have yet to see, you know, what happens when it's tabled against the nice Commons. It will happen potentially in the coming weeks, uh, as even as early as February. But more importantly, and it's of course mobilised a huge amount of people from. NGOs to civil society groups to movements to trade unions. The real question has got to be is what happens when most of these laws become into place? And as we know that you know, the, the parliamentary arithmetic means that we are not going to be able to vote down all of these attacks. There will be a substantial amount of these bills will get through. We may strike down some of the more egregious elements of it, but there's no doubt that there will be quite a lot that attack still continues to under undermine our rights then the next stage will be you know how do we as as ordinary citizens and the people and movements build our collective power to be able to challenge these to, to these laws whether that's through the courts or whether that's on the streets and you know having been involved in a new number of of campaigns around police bills and we've seen governments attempt to introduce draconian legislation before and it's took the power of movements on the streets to really you know move the dial to uh, make those laws uh, impossible to, to to implement and make governments change their mind because they feel there's such a massive backlash for the, from these pieces of legislation. So the real challenge, I think, is not just what's going to happen in Parliament, but more importantly, what's happening out on the streets and what's happening in our movement building and whether our movements are going to be strong enough, focused enough to ensure that, you know, we protect all of parts of our movements when it comes under attack from these draconian legislation. Yes, I mean, the streets continue to be the, the strongest response to these attacks across the world. 
Um, and I know that we'll be following at People's Dispatch all of these developments. I encourage people to check out waronwant.org to follow the amazing work that's being done by Assad and all of his colleagues and you know people on the ground, communities that are resisting. Um, of course, this constitutes not only an attack on the rights of the people of the UK, but I think it really, as you mentioned, sets a dangerous precedent of what we're looking towards um, in the coming period. Um, so just want to thank you so much, Assad, for talking us through this complicated moment in the UK um, and we'll surely be following along. And, and thank you, Zoe, and thank you to People's Dispatchers. I think you rightly report from all around the world. This is not just something that's happening in isolation in the United States or just happening in isolation in the UK. We see the same attacks, whether it's Modi in India against the Indian farmers. We've seen it on the streets, of course, in, in terms of on Palestine. We've seen repressive legislation in Colombia and Brazil, etc. We're seeing a global attack by the elites to roll back our rights and our right as ordinary people to be able to challenge these institutional and embedded powers of of injustice but as we know uh, people power is a most important power that we have and uh, so uh, great your work and great for continuing to shine a spotlight and solidarity to you and everybody at people's dispatch thanks so much again and thanks for joining us